and simply made Godzilla the informal mascot or archetype for Wicked Issues. Welcome back to the Cities Rematch podcast, the show we are looking into how we can learn from each other's experiences and become the best urban change makers we can be. I'm your voice of choice, Johannes Riegler, and this is Godzilla's Fury for Reimagining Cities. <laughs> Yeah, that was a bit too dramatic, I guess. But it's the season finale, and this is a little bit of a party episode. And you need to listen closely today to find out about the truth and secrets behind the city's reimagined and what is going to happen in the future and what that has to do with the old Japanese Godzilla squeals, do-it-yourself practices, power brokers, and the band Kraftwerk. So we really have reached the end of season one and i'm super happy to have jonas bülund on the show again you might have heard the show uh, where he was on cities reimagined on uh, reimagining urban futures a couple of months back the last months have been quite a ride i tell you so we had thousands of downloads of the podcast and countless of interactions on social media and emails and comments and conversations on Cities Reimagined. And I'm super happy and grateful that you stuck with me and went on this journey together with me. So reflecting on the last 11 or 13, depending on how you count, episodes of Cities Reimagined, I really recognized soon after starting the podcast that producing the show took a specific twist for me. It was not only about producing a podcast anymore. It became something larger than that, actually. It became part of a larger learning story on urban matters of linking people, topics, approaches, and making them accessible to a broader audience. But it was not only that. It was also a way for me to distill key messages behind the stories and narratives people brought onto the show. My guest today, Jonas Bülund, is a researcher at the Royal University of Technology, KTH, in Stockholm, Sweden. And he's also a musician. So you need to stick around to the end of the episode to find out about his special Godzilla remix of the City's Reimagined jingle. If you like the content of the show, please subscribe to the channel, rate it, uh, leave a comment, follow us on social media, just like Instagram to find out more background stories on the show and let me know what you think of it. Uh, give me your feedback uh, by sending an email at johannes at anthropocene.city. That's all for the monologue today. Enjoy this wild episode called Godzilla's Fury for Reimagining Cities. <laughs> Okay, let's start. Bring it on. Hi, Jonas. How are you doing? I'm fine. It's okay. It's how okay. I'm very well. I got up at six this morning, so I have an early schedule nowadays. And I already sat on the balcony preparing for our talk. So it was a good slow morning already, although it's Friday. It's not just weekend yeah. yet. Yeah, I think this is a very good Friday activity. Yeah, I think so too. So now it's 10 for everybody listening. How is the metropolis of Nista on this Friday morning? It's nice. Uh, it's, uh, how do you say, gray bluish sky, typical yeah. March sky, high clouds, but thick and dense. And everybody is waiting for the rains in the weekend. Jonas, uh, the regular listeners of Cities Reimagined might remember you from, I think it was episode three. Um, where you and uh, Josephine Wangel were on the show to talk about urban futures. So you're yes. not only an urban researcher, I would also say you're a musician and you're you're doing Taekwondo as well, right? Yes. Yes. So I have I have one question for you. And I because I worked with you for a couple of years and I know that you draw your inspiration from a lot of different sources, not only urban related sources. Um And I was wondering, how does this non-urban 
stuff you're doing, like Taekwondo, or do, being a musician, playing in bands, how does that influence your practice and your thinking, your creativity on urban related things? I'm not sure. Um, in, in both Taekwondo and in music, it is there are some analogies to also working, maybe not when I'm working alone, well, there is something to that as well. Finding rhythms, finding things which has a, you, you can sense when it has a beat and how you can be, how you can learn techniques in order to improvise and be creative. Uh, that's a typical thing. And both in kind of martial arts, that's kind of a trick where there's, there's seemingly a lot of discipline. But if you're sparring and if you think about it as self-defense, you also need to be able to improvise quite quickly mm -hmm. but still have a lot of technique in your muscle memory and it's similar with playing music creating music alone or also especially if you're playing in a band and how you are how to as some other musicians call it how to get yourself out of the way so to speak mm -hmm. uh to make things that are inviting, that are uh, kind of uh, how you invite others to also be able to shine. It's yeah. Interesting yeah. That's also how we train in the martial arts. It's like, how how can we train with each other, not against each other? It's, yeah. It's a saying. I know. But it, it sounds to me that it's very much both in martial arts, Taekwondo, and um, being a musician, it also relates to all the experiences you had in the past the what you learned in the past what you the impulses the creativity which was exposed to you to coming back to the discussion actually we had with josephine you were exposed to which you at some point later you might make be able to make sense out of that and i think often it is with with urban studies and with urbanism it's a it's a bit similar yes quite so i mean one part in the i mean it always of course depends on what aspects of urban studies you are doing kind of but but just just a way of finding let's say the stories the 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 interesting mysteries and so on that has it has sometimes a similar kind of it may draw you you may draw upon what you've been exposed to to find mm -hmm. it interesting, of course, but sometimes I can also have a sense that oh, but this it it swings right. Mm -hmm. It has a groove. It has something that I like, which is hard to pin down a, a sense of it. And sometimes it may also be because of the kind of the comedy that I like, for example, Monty Python. Yeah, how that influences what kinds of urban stuff that I find interesting and 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 worthy of uh, kind of examination has usually has some kind of bizarre <laughs> comedy is Monty, around it. Is, Mo is Monty Python like urban policy making? I think so. Yeah. Uh, a lot. Uh, maybe maybe unintentionally at times, but yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the effects are quite similar, one might say. <laughs> You know, I invited you again to to City Reimagined, and I'm very thankful that you are taking the time again to reflect what has happened in the first season of Cities Reimagined. So this episode is a bit of a season finale. It will be very dramatic. The truth will come out. All the hidden layers between and under the episodes will be exposed. Um, I'm not sure that that will happen, but I would like to reflect with you on the show and what has happened. Uh, what were three key moments for you uh, in season one of Cities Reimagined? Well, uh, first of all, I would say looking at the podcast and, and what has happened over half a year or so, a little bit more congratulations, I would like to say to Thank a, wonderful you. Set, a wonderful set of conversations. I mean, I must say, I, I truly enjoyed it, listening to a lot of it. Uh, and of course, okay, so I, I made some notes. Three key moments, I think, City Mind was one. And I'm not mm -hmm. taking them in order now. Um, yeah. But I'm taking kind of episodes. 
city mind because Sophie and Jim's perspective on the emergent city, the changing city. I think I think that their their way of 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 uh, working with collective and a kind of a non arrogant research that yeah. they enable is I th I thought that was quite uh, um, hopeful. Uh, also, the episode on cultural centers, uh, mm -hmm. which I, in my head, was on provisional spaces, but it, it's more than that, of course. But Tiffany's kind of transnational networking aspects and doing what you're passionate about locally, mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. The kind of the networking, the almost global networking and, and very local action. And there was that kind of punk ethos mm -hmm. in there um, and the third one I actually kind of collude um, uh, Alexander and the urban food and agroecology Ukraine and the urban food because they were articulating kind of the, the urban collective or conviviality to use a very technical term what is that? In the social conviviality, how to live together, principles mm -hmm. for living together, more or less, that they mm -hmm. were both talking about, I thought was also kind of key, even if it, I know it's a bit more conceptual, uh, but they both tried to ground it very well, those two episodes. Yeah, for me, it was also, there was so much key messages coming out, or so much interesting conversations in all of these episodes where you can just, um, I think there's so much to learn, unpack, and hopefully coming back to what we started with today, people will listen to it and being exposed or hearing new new insights in a way and come back to a later stage to, to, this, uh, yeah, to this inspiration, hopefully. But for me, what I was very interested in, and I think I still have way to go to improve that, but it is to, to, um, to show the people and the motivations behind projects and knowledge produced because it is so often that we you know go to conferences be somewhere where you present a project you um you know you talk about what you're doing what you what, what the aim of a project is what urban challenge you're addressing but there's rarely a space where you talk about the motivation where you come from personally and i think with with cities reimagined with the first season it somehow succeeded to to break the shell of that a little bit to go a little bit deeper what motivates people so what are the stories behind i remember the uh luisa bravo in the first episode talking about her childhood and teenage memories of public spaces in italy which ultimately led her to focus on public space research and working with that but there's also more than more stories hidden behind that we talked about it when how we first were yeah going to the bigger cities and uh being somehow impressed by that and there's so much different motivations also with city mind with jim and sophie who brought a different perspective to that uh, there was a recurring topic of punk and hardcore somehow uh in this this ethic but also it showed with with the conversation with Stefan Fugger also coming from a very different angle on of local urban journalism, which doesn't have an urbanism focus as such, that there is so many different perspectives and so many different ambitions and motivations to dive into urban stuff. Let's call it like that. And I would like to, I wanted to to showcase or show that a little bit on the show. So how would you how would you sum up season one? What did you what did it add to a broader debate on urbanism? Would you say? Yeah. Um, well, uh, that that's a kind of a tricky question. I, I don't think there is a broader debate on urbanism. Actually, <laughs> I mean, sometimes in different contexts it may seem as this is the big debate on urbanism, but then there are so many debates going on in parallel depending on where you are, if you're in Brussels in a policy yeah. setting or if you're in an activist camp or if you are in some engineering uh, sector and so on. Um, 
I think some efforts are made to frame urbanity in single statements, like in policy. Mm -hmm. And for example, like research like Richard Sennett, he has a way of doing that sometimes, right? Uh, but it's uh, usually quite obvious that it's only about key aspects of, for certain parts of how humans can live their lives together uh, and in between urban settings. So I, I think the the kind of the important thing, if we're thinking about a broader debate on urbanism, is or perhaps the the challenge is to to keep in mind all of these different ways of living and understanding the city, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Contemporary human societies even more so, but the urban part of it, uh, and shaping through that a broader sense of what the urban is and i think well to preempt a little bit uh something that we've been thinking about is that it shows the need for squirrels to yeah it that way and <laughs> making friends with godzilla oh yeah godzilla we will come back to that hopefully yeah. today we but to so, that. but yeah. the question was particularly right on season one yeah I just had to to talk about the, that sense of the broader urban debate because it's rarely in singular. But I, I think season one was a bit like the, it was drawing by numbers. Do you do that? Is that an English expression where you have a picture, but uh, you have nodes identified by numbers and then you draw and suddenly there is a little elephant or something? Yeah. Or Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I was thinking about what kinds of urbanities are emerging from from the sample of about i don't know was it 12 11 12 episodes 12 yeah it was, it was 11 full ones and in total it was 13 so with yeah. the bonus on the trailer so that the this is a set of aspects of imagining or reimagining the city across the world today so what reimaginations are kind of coming forward through if we draw through all these numbers i think that's an exercise to do and I think I'm still trying to do it. Um, you mentioned to me that it has been a longer journey of learning, right? Yeah. The, uh, the, the picaresque, as you would say, in, in literature, like, like Voltaire and Candide. Um, so I think that there is also to this a kind of a naive stance. It's like, for example, approaching urban wildlife or African urbanity with honest curiosity and as much prejudice open, I mean, transparent mm -hmm. as possible. And hence, in that way, taking a naive stance, but not being naive. Uh, I think that's a characterization of the season, which is very good for me. Yeah. I think that's a kind of an humble approach to it. But it also makes me very curious as to what you actually learned, right? And for this conversation where I'm listening a lot to what you've learned, and one of the red threads, one of these kinds of drawing by numbers and the journey, I think, is what you already mentioned, is the do-it-yourself practices and aesthetics, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of punk ethos that you were surprisingly, you, you were commenting in some of the episodes, hey, now I'm hearing that you also have a punk background. Oh, and you also, and you also. Yeah, that's interesting. So that kind of... Uh, let's say the attitude of not waiting for permission to do important stuff seems to be an important kind of line to draw mm -hmm. through all the episodes. Yeah. But uh, also there is something here. It's not just doing, not just rushing away and I, I don't need permission, but there's also a kind of a sense to make sure how you reflect upon if it's wise to do it. So I think that's kind of also important. Mm -hmm. What I what I found very interesting with season one is that it showed this very local aspects to urban. Ur, I I just call it urban stuff, you know, because yeah. skateboarding per se is not an urbanist topic, if you will. You know, building a skateboard in a in a in a suburb of of Peru. I don't think many people involved in urbanism would see that as something related to urban transitions. But at the same time, you have, um, I had the conversation with Alexander on, you know, reimagining Ukrainian cities after the war, which is, you know, a, a complete different topic on a complete different scale on, on a 
you know, it, and then at the same time, I had the conversation with uh, Paul Curie, who talked about, uh, yeah, basically, I wouldn't say for the whole of Africa, but he covered aspects of urbanism across Africa, which has another scale to the debate. Yeah, exactly. So, so these are the very different perspectives, but the sharing a kind of a uh, let's say an ethos or kind of a, a um how would you say uh, a, many times sharing a way an attitude towards yeah. the work yeah which is i think is um the the interesting aspects and as you say that it's because it's urban stuff so we could i think we could do it's not just that urban farming urban uh <laughs> agriculture is uh, for some people still a bit odd but i think we could just put urban in front of anything and trying to see if there is an episode to be done about it that would be an I, interesting uh mix yeah which is which is i think i mean over all over the world we probably would find an example of how that how however <laughs> unimaginable it would be to do in a city you you'd find someone doing it like it's it's that famous video for example from 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 dinosaur junior i think when they're just driving around manhattan or new york manhattan in a golf car and playing golf and and not in the parks but everywhere and i think so we also saw later on that there is actually urban golf <laughs> That's so funny. That's what I did in the teenage years. We bought a club, um, a, a golf club for a couple of euros. Maybe it was shilling back then still when a sports shop closed down. And then we played golf everywhere in parks, in, uh, you know, in on the street and so on. And it was, it was a great experience also because it was, you know, before becoming an urbanist, it was a reimagining cities kind of situation. Yep. So let, let me try one thing. I put, I'm not sure if I will put that on a podcast, but I open uh, chat GTP and I say, what should I put in? Give me a list of stuff. Give me a list of stuff. 10, maximum 10. Of course, here's a diverse list of things you might be interested or you might be find interesting or useful. Book recommendation, travel destination, gadget, hobby, movie, recipe to try, online course, fitness activity, podcast, yeah. do-it-yourself project. Okay, so we have an urban book recommendation, urban travel destination, urban gadget, an urban hobby, urban movie, urban recipe, urban online course. Urban fitness activity, urban podcast. Yeah, that, that's easy. And urban uh, DIY project. So we have the topics for the next season. Yeah, you have 10 topics there, right? Yeah. You can do a, you can do an episode about urban podcasting. Yeah, there's more people doing urban podcasts. Maybe I, I yeah. actually thought about that. I think I think you have to publish this list on Instagram and then have people like telling you or if, if they have any recommendations or yeah. ideas huh? i'm a bit disappointed i have to say i thought it would have been funnier now the 10 recommendations that's a bit random well we tried well, but, but that's the thing with chat gtp and and also the visuals that ai seems to be producing at the moment it's it always turns out a little bit less exciting mm -hmm. than one would hope sometimes surprising and fascinating yeah. but always slightly less surprising a bit like shut the stock images of yeah meetings or linkedin kind of postings yeah <laughs> yes exactly but coming back to season one what do you think were the deep buried secrets in season one what was that what was the drama we found yeah uh uh yeah uh i'm you see my hesitation. I'm um uh in a lot. I think I've learned a lot, uh, but there's still something elusive, secretive about how the city can be reimagined. 
uh, mm -hmm. from what to what and for whom and, um i think that's still that's <laughs> that's a deep bird secret i can't really uh, uh um have out in the daylight yet from the episodes i think we still need to explore a little bit more on that from what to what and for whom but i think that's not so we will never succeed in being clear in that no <laughs> It will be always a, a reimagining one aspect for specific people, for specific interests also, which yeah. comes together then and manifests in urban space. Yeah, I think that's the trick. Rather. It, it's not always easy. It's not always the point to give a kind of a synthesis and, and make a clear statement. Yeah. Maybe that's what I was on to. What were the mysteries? resolved what was the clue with the what was the detective work we did over the first season what was the the mysteries the the murder solved yeah again i, th I think that's the interesting thing i I, th I thought of it this way um maybe the urban mysteries or the it's the urban transitions that they are like planning and intentional change. And of course I say that because that's one of the kind of research topics I do. Mm -hmm. They rarely turn out as you imagine them, right? Also, one should be very careful for what one wishes for. Uh, maybe that's one of the mysteries not solved, but uh, uh, pointed at. In what way? But Can you be more specific? Yeah, because I mean, it's it's kind of an an old saying, like with Aladdin and and having wishes. Of course, uh, 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 powers the universe can grant you wishes, but it also comes with unexpected kind of <laughs> consequences as well. Right? Mm -hmm. We we can never we can never just have those mysteries uh, uh there is a mystery around how still and i think that's especially so for urban transitions that when we want to change in a certain way and when we do it there is also a ton of other things a mass a lot of other things that changed as well which we perhaps weren't ready for there's something in the episodes that points to this and how to actually work with that kind of in technical terms, you would call it probably externalities, but mm -hmm. I mean, both positive and negative ones. How, how do you take care of the positive ones? How do you kind of, uh, uh, um, picked up the challenge of the negative ones and so on. That leads us to Godzilla, doesn't it? Yeah. So for everybody out there who doesn't know what, what we mean by Godzilla, that is a bit of an internal joke we have. And it leads back to a presentation I gave, I think, six, seven years ago, once in Brussels, which I think confused yeah. a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> but we kept we kept the narrative going. So it yep. was about uh, uh, how complex urban um, urban development is, and how complex urbanism is, and how wicked it is. What wick what a wicked issue it is by bringing together these complexities between. Um, disciplines, interests, um, fields of work as well. And it is so complex that you cannot solve it. And I just compared it to Godzilla, because if you try to get rid of Godzilla in, let's say, with technological solutions, so basically by shooting uh, rockets at Godzilla, Godzilla doesn't mind. Godzilla will go further and will become more angry and will let you feel the consequences of your actions. And it is a bit similar to uh, in urbanism where you might try to not kill Godzilla to so break down the complexity, but actually work with it. So befriend Godzilla, make him somehow, you will never understand Godzilla and his actions fully, but you might be able to yeah, you know, make him your pet in a way or make him your friend, you know, your odd friend you, you don't really understand, but make him go along with you. Yeah, I think as I, I, of course, I remember that. And I think 
what you actually did, I remember, I mean, how I experienced it was that we had been started talking about urban dilemmas and, and wicked issues. And you, you'd been kind of around in some projects talking about super wicked issues and simply made Godzilla the informal mascot or yeah. archetype for wicked issues. Um, and I wouldn't like to say monster. Of course, it's a, it's the same kind of mystery, but it was to talk about urban issues, environmental, economic, innovation, dynamics, public administration practices out of hand, for example. Yeah. So a bit like Frankenstein's monster, right? It only becomes monstrous when we don't care about it, when we don't love it, when yeah. we don't make friends with it, so to speak. So... I thought of that idea was somehow to give the very abstract nature of urban dilemmas and make it issue a face, a personality. So that I think that's why it stuck and it kept on popping up in PowerPoints over the years. <laughs> and only a few who knew about it kind of saw it even. But that, that kind of personality wrecking urban landscapes and it is reckless yet misunderstood. I think sometimes I also felt planners, planning practitioners, or anyone who was trying to do urban policy was also kind of in that Godzilla genre. Yeah. Um, but so, so I've been thinking a little bit about this since we are talking a lot about Godzilla and the kind of fury that's involved in that, the mystery and the fury. Uh, that wicked issues and dilemmas, they tend to shape what one could call fire spaces. I mean, not, not fires like burning cities, but fire spaces are spaces where there is a lot of friction and controversy, right? And policy hates this. But it means that you have to work with a lot of uncomfortable tolerance, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It takes time, it takes a lot of time. And trust, it, it needs a lot of trust. So this is far from the kind of common Western techno-rational approach of looking for perhaps quick fixes, looking for solutions. And to, to, to bring on that, what the episodes also point at is um, that this kind of challenge, uh, uh, one of the better descriptions I've read, is actually situated on Mars uh, in Ken Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy. Uh, it's worthy of a read or a listen to when it comes to these kinds of wicked issues that constantly pop up and also the kind of working with very different angles, aspects, perspectives on how to live together. Mm -hmm. So... Because added to this, there is this kind of activism, do-it-yourself, local community actors that are not always seen with good eyes by yeah. informal politics and power brokers or formal politics and power brokers, right? So they are small or large monsters, depending on the situation. Yeah. Uh, but what happens if policy would start to truly love them, right? Uh, would they be loved to death, as I seem to remember Sophie and Jim? of sit to mind they fear that right but but if they really if if uh, policy is such a you know a uh, uh, straw figure of something but but there, there is something to how different types of actors could start getting near to each other with tolerance and and with care i guess yeah and I, I really like that we keep the Godzilla going. And now it's out there. I hope I hope when when people see a Godzilla now, they think of uh, wicked urban issues and they think about your comment just now. I mean, yeah, I think we were maybe you could count us on one hand who knew what Godzilla stands for. Yeah, now it's out there. Now everybody does. Yeah. That's good. So welcome so, to the club, dear listeners. Welcome to the club, everybody. Uh, feel invited to put uh, uh, little Godzilla's on your PowerPoints. Um, you know, it, it is from now on a bit of a secret sign that when Godzilla is on your slides, you you are one of those who understand. Yeah. And of course, I think many times one can simply just use the emoji for Tyrannosaurus Rex, I think it is. I think yeah, that's, that's our stand-in. Yeah, that is the pro tip. Yeah. Okay, coming back to uh, cities reimagined. So I'm. I have to say, I'm quite happy with 
the content and the creation of the of season one, how it turned out. So some some of the topics I planned on having on the show from the very beginning, when I started Cities Reimagined, some just popped in for various reasons, uh, like the skateboarding one in Peru, which I found very um, <laughs> a very interesting angle to it. And then it was Christian Fisher saying, "Hey, I, I have this documentary coming," um, and then it just it just made sense. What do you think? Did we cover? What aspects did we not cover? What was not in there? What could have been in there? And what is what is there missed for season? What we might be able to uh, pick up in season uh, two? Hmm. I'm not sure about topics, especially. Uh, 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 uh. I. I think about it this way. Um, maybe there are more mysteries out there. Yeah. That you don't solve. You don't explain it. It's not like Mythbusters or anything, but but rather, um, I was thinking about the kind of reenchantment that we sometimes also need. That mysteries are also kind of drivers, inspiration for just keep on doing what you do yeah seeing seeing like your everyday places spaces urban public spaces perhaps in a slightly different light means that oh there's something it might be exciting or it might make you angry or passionate mm -hmm. even more passionate about the work you do but that's a very conceptual and abstract yeah. answer. So very practical, breaking it down. I, I think for, for season two, I would like to have more city administration on on the show. Because I think there uh there has been, yeah, they are not very well represented in this debate at, yet, at least not on cities reimagined. So it would be interesting to have uh, you know, a person who's very visionary also to, you know, not reinforce. Uh, development strategies let's put it like that a bit boring stuff but like really goes into a visionary process to to reimagine a city with people living in the city and with what what it means also in terms of public administration to go beyond the silos of you know the sectoral approach of mobility and environment and so on because i think there's a lot of challenges and i i would really like to have an honest com uh, conversation about these issues yeah I, th I think you're right i didn't want to propose it since uh, i do a lot of research on public administration yeah and and how they are trying or of course they're seen as these kind of monolith uh sometimes uh, but it's just a lot of very different types of persons and organizations that we are talking about when we're talking about public administrations and i think also not a few of them that i met in our work are actually very passionate about trying to find new connections and they are very kind of sometimes sincere but very mindful of uh what exactly they can do what they are allowed to do uh, in terms of mandate etc but i think that there is usually a kind of a passion in there sometimes sometimes it's not uh and so that kind of an un honest conversation might be very interesting um i think so that that kind of brings me to what i thought about more as as a thinking about the second uh, uh, season as it would continue this uh, let's say <laughs> mysteries and, and red thread around do it yourself or what you can do perhaps as a person because that's a conversation right but that they're looking at the context that there are a, new, a lot of new ways of connecting uh, there is an intuition there and I'm also drawing about the good from the Godzilla thinking right mm -hmm. What is sustainable development with a healthy dose of love added, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But love in 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 the kind of a, not the romantic type of what do I get? Kind of what kind of state am I in? But rather, how can I care for this? 
how can I be in a regenerative ethos about this? Yeah. Uh, but then and I, I th and I, that's where I think the public administrations, policy makers, other types of actors might get into the conversation as, as well. Very interesting that you bring up love or this this kind of uh, this pr perspective because it, it links to uh, to a notion of caring and a notion of um, emotions and more you know more personal, more soft stuff. Whereas in urbanism, it's too often I would say, you know, focused on the facts, focused on the hard stuff, focused on the concrete. Yeah. Okay. So. First of all, I, I, I would like to avoid the adjectives hard and soft, uh, since it's quite philocentric, <laughs> quite simply. It, it usually goes for facts and so on, but you can talk about it in, in different ways and still have the same meaning. I mean, if it's graspable or not. Um, the contours of facts and the contours of uh, understandings and so on. But yeah, there is a kind of a logic of care that I think could be a bit way. And I'm inspired by some of my master's students who are kind of reading up on feminist theories about um, architecture of care and how to do design care, care as a design principle and so on. Um, but how perhaps it's also about how we find the freedom to act with care rather than just push an agenda of freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. is something that I see as a kind of a theme. Uh, and okay, so if, if I go into it a little bit, there is a kind of a Western concept of freedom that is somehow in the last instance, free from responsibilities or connections even, mm -hmm. right? And it's probably one reason that way, why we have this rampant type of neoliberal capitalism uh, and that that is that kind of choice is felt like a right apart from being right-wing uh, many times, but because it's a very powerful aesthetic. And also for a lot of the people on the left side and the activists, there is this kind of freedom that you're not connected to the wrong stuff, so to speak. Um, but care kind of has the potential to perhaps put that in a different light. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, as care is about connections uh, and, and and some of them are you're not free to choose but you can become very free in them or fulfilled and feel kind of that to uh, action is something that you can you can do stuff because of the connections because of your nurturing connections because you're feeding connections and so on so there's been a lot of that and, and some types of feminist science and technology studies as well. Um, and I think that's where we're getting near to the principle of being regenerative. Right. And I but think... You, yeah, the fulfillment would, of giving, kind of. Yeah, I want to pick your brain on, on that as well, because I, at the moment, I see this, this care for... Or this re regenerative principle, regenerative idea for caring for the planet and for for humans or for people at the same time, um, as very cutting edge and coming in more and more in urban studies. And I think this is, at least for me, this is one of the most interesting um, places, topics at the moment, which are developing in practice, but also in 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 thinking about it and eventually also policy. I don't know. I haven't yeah. seen too much about it yet because people are still stuck with their idea of their uh, GDP growth and on these kind of uh, this kind of old school thinking, which limits everything, all the other thinking in a certain way. I would say, I just inintentionally said old old school thinking, but I, I I somehow maybe that that describes it very well. What, what what's your take on this? Well, maybe not that it's old school, perhaps in that sense, but 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 what I've also heard a lot from people who are working close to planning practitioners and, and also some of the investigations I've been part of myself, um, th there is a sense sometimes that we're, we're, we're getting directives and we're doing this, but we're supposed to do 
the other thing, right? So that, that there is a kind of a disconnect, a dissonance, yeah. if you will, uh, between what the job should be about and what you clearly see as this needs to be done and what you can do and what you're allowed to do, et cetera. And I think even politicians, local politicians, regional politicians, national politicians also feel this at times. So I, I wouldn't blame politicians for setting this up. It's more of a it's more of a situation that kind of sets a scene where you can act in certain ways and you can't act in others. Yeah, you're which, stuck. Yeah, which probably makes some some of these uh, policy makers and planning practitioners perhaps, <laughs> I wouldn't say jealous of the, the activists, so to speak, even if some don't like the label, but that you have in the, the first season, right? But we're also coming back to something that uh, you mentioned just before we started, the kind of the bike that's in your living room, yeah. which you haven't got around to 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 repair for quite some time. And I started thinking about that kind of um, care as in that old book, Zen and the Art of Repairing Motorcycles or, or the Art of Motorcycle re Maintenance. There is a similar kind of, even if that's a, that's a lot more male coded, but there's a similar kind of thing around thinking and doing things with care. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything will be successful or, you know, come out great, but it might mean that you can carve out some space, time, to try to do what feels right. And that might be important, but maybe that's more hypothetical. But um, here I'm going to go into kind of urban transformations from this point and say that this might be about going from information and data that we have for, you know, problems that AI can help us with, of course, but there's a lot of digitalization, but we, we get a lot of knowledge on what a problem is or what's going on, right? And then there we go to knowledge, and that's been mainly our job in research and innovation programming and so on. There are um, probably thousands of papers and reports that are saying, something producing you know providing knowledge on gaps and issues of some kinds um, but that knowledge on what is needed for urban transformations is probably only part of the mix i think the what you may be kind of uh, searching for is also the capacities among different actors to do transformations so it's yeah. not just about individual training or one or the other decision-making support tool. So this is about um, setting up resources for actors to move between settings, perhaps sectors and generating wisdom, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, wisdom is an interesting word, in, of course, but it's about care, kind of driven by an ethos of care, perhaps. Great. I think that from, for some listeners that might sound a bit abstract, but I think this is this captures very well what we have been working on or talking about the last weeks and months, right? Yeah. So uh, should we go into that a little bit? Because I like I actually like this um, a very transparent process of what we what we work on and see where where it leads us. So just to to let you know, we Jonas and I have been working on an idea called Anthropocene City. Well, it's not an idea. The idea is more what, what Anthropocene City is. So it could be a kind of platform or an initiative for urban learning, for connecting knowledge with policy and other urban actors to actually cultivate the wisdom required for reimagining cities or for doing things differently in cities. And at the moment, there's a kind of gap between those, I would say, oftentimes, mm -hmm. because there is uh, the knowledge, the production of knowledge and experiences, which is often coming out of the, you know, the funding logic of uh, being financed for three, four years. But then there's a gap on how, what to do with that. Some cities and some, in some cases, it might be taken up by 
a longer process of experimentation and uh, being used very strategically, while in others it would just end up in a report and a in a kind of communication logic which goes from you know we have some findings we throw them out there, do with it what you want, uh, and that usually that doesn't fly. That doesn't lead to a bigger transformation in other cities. So we are kind of working on that. Yeah, kind of to be continued. Uh, to be but continued. I, but, I th but I think that <laughs> um, it kind of grows out of the podcast season one. Yeah. Some of the conclusions are kind of fed into and probably made more into uh, a, a very typical consultancy prospect uh, sheet. But, you know, yeah, you, you have to do that as well. But I think that season two is also interesting as a kind of a lab to try some of these thoughts yeah right and i have to say that you're absolutely right um i think while doing these talks i wouldn't call it interviews but having these conversations with people working on reimagining cities i at some point found out wait a minute this is a bit more than just having a conversation this is about you know getting personal perspective but also distilling kind of the gist out of what is very often not written in reports and cannot be cannot be easily communicated. So that's the thinking behind that. And hopefully we will, you will hear about that. It will go eventually in a direction where we can publish more stuff and be more detailed because we need to wrap our head around that still. Yeah. <laughs> Right, but coming back to to very operational kind of things in uh, with cities we mentioned. So I I had all of the episodes transcribed, and I I I sit on a pile of about one hundred fifty A four single lined pages of transcript of cities we mentioned, and I think it would be a pity to, not to use this knowledge and this uh, these outcomes of the podcast. And I was thinking, coming back to AI, uh, that is already now a, con uh, a topic which reoccurs in our conversation. But you know, I, it's very difficult to to fit in the work of cities reimagined in a in a regular job already, and it will be, it would be even more difficult to feed that into uh, you know to produce a publication out of that. But I was thinking of. Uh, somehow trying with AI to make sense out of these uh, interviews by taking the key messages which are distilled out of that and letting AI formulate a text of the transcripts. What are your takes on that? Do you think that would work or would it would it be too flat? Would it lose uh, too much uh, nuances which are actually the value of these conversations? Well, so let me put it this way, and a, a little story from one of the courses that I'm part of teaching at at, at, at my work at uh, university, more or less, um, where we had the students to analyze two, let's say, two very, well, two, three pages long research proposals that is, uh, research proposals are to give you an idea of, hey, there's a problem here. And hey, this is what you can do to solve it. Or this is what I can do and give me money to do it, kind of to shape that kind of interest. And, and wow, what's going on here? Oh, oh, this is important, right? Um, but we had, we had them analyze and compare one research to pro proposal that was written by a student in the course proceeding and which had a very good grade, and one written by ChatGPT uh, or AI, I think. I think it was ChatGPT. <laughs> even though uh, to two of the other teachers who actually sat down and tried to have the, the AI write the proposal after a couple of iterations, they thought, okay, this is this is probably as much time as we have and is as good as it gets. Uh, within two seconds, my students 
oh, this is the AI. It's flat. It it's not really interesting. It's it's not really grabbing me. It's just doing the kind of a, a kind of a business pitch, but it's not really setting up a, a kind of an a problem, a mystery that yeah, hey, this is where we want to go. So I think it's a good experiment, but I think almost you or we should do one of our own first and then do the experiment. You mean a summary of a uh, of a conversation, and then yeah. and then trying it with with AI to yeah. see how how it compares. It's a good experiment. I mean, we we'd have to do the synthesis of the hundred and fifty pages, and then <laughs> we have AI to do it. Yeah, and of course we can mix it uh, however we want it. It's a bit like if we're going back to music and. Taekwondo, perhaps, but music even more so. Than, yes, I'm very used to to do stuff with analog, like acoustic guitars or electric guitars. But mixing that with kind of more machine and programmed sounds, it's not a thing today. Yeah. It actually makes for a lot of very interesting music. I think it was very interesting also when I think back in the days when Kraftwerk were kind of in their early days, they were doing it and so on. So, so I don't think it, it's more about how, if we find it interesting and engaging enough to do that kind of a mix. And yeah. for us, it's about finding time to do the synthesis. Yeah. I will keep it in mind. It would be, it would be very interesting to you to try something out and see if we find a way where, which makes sense. Where yeah. we don't th think uh, that too much is lost in the in the going via machine while you know producing something meaningful eventually. Yeah. So my point was perhaps that I mean, usually drum machines in their own right they don't really groove, but sometimes they can unexpectedly groove because of it's a bit queer, quaint, the things that mm -hmm. kind of brings how how a groove actually emerges from when you're playing together let's try it we will see all right but um i think that leads us to the last point i would like to discuss with you today and that is a bit uh also about the future uh and season two of cities reimagine and that is a bit yeah mixing formats so for the first season there were these conversations and they're good as they are. I also learned that it is uh, quite, uh, it makes a, a more interesting conversation when you have three people. So me as moderating and then two, two others joining, and it makes a more lively discussion or a more lively exchange. Jonas, what are your takes on, on the formats for the next season? So I thought about, we also talked about that having kind of shorts covering uh, specific urban phenomena uh, in maybe a 10 minute discussion, we uh, had this, this example of Italian man who apparently tend to stand around construction sites and um, being smart on commenting on what is happening on the, uh, what was the name, Umarel? I think it was Umarel. Umarel. Yeah, I think there's much to unpack there because it could be, you know, the, the reasons and the, the the interest of these Italian older man could be that it is a form of socialization. It's a form of community engagement, but we don't need to go into that now. Otherwise, we produce the short right now. Uh, I wanted to, to discuss with you. Shall we have these shorts? And then the second one is I initially thought um, it would be good to have confrontations on the show, having uh, opposing um, standpoints two people with opposing standpoints on the show discussing it. But then this morning when I prepared for our conversation, I actually thought like, no, this is not, I would not like that because it is, um, there is already so much confrontation everywhere, but actually rather I would like to bring two opposites together to have a kind of, you know, um, generating having creating a kind of understanding between them you know not going into the calling it a confrontation but having two opposing standpoints and it eventually figuring out 
I wouldn't say middle ground, but what it, where are the connections? You know, listening to the other ideas and other standpoints and thus maybe contributing to understanding the Godzilla. Yeah, or making friends. Making it's friends. Not, it's not yeah. always fully understanding, but understanding some of it might yeah. be helpful. Uh, I guess what I also hear is something that we know in political philosophy as the difference between antagonism, like understanding politics as you have antagonists and they are trying to destroy each other, which we have a lot in the US American uh, kind of politics, it seems, especially so at the moment. Uh, on the other hand, you have an ideal or or an idea about how you could work in an agonistic way that mm -hmm. is you you share some values perhaps one of them being we shouldn't destroy our opponents by any means necessary but rather trying to figure out ways and it's usually quite uncomfortable ways of of um uh shedding light on different sides of the asp of of an is issue right yeah and then that's the kind of becomes an idea for democratic discussion or constructive democratic discussion and so on that's that's Chantal move i guess is the kind of the origin of how that's conceptualized but and i think that's a very good way to go thinking about that as a format there might be a way of having one of these shorts and then you have two people talking about that with who perhaps don't agree to interpretations, what it means, what possible consequences X or Y could have and so on. Right. Yeah, excellent. And and I think they both should have one cake each that they can throw in each other's faces. What kind of cake? Cherry? Or yeah, but lots of cream. Otherwise it hurts. Lots of cream. Yeah. It needs to be a thick one. A thick yeah. cake. Big thick cake. Yeah, excellent. So season two will be about concealers, cake, regenerative AI. Is that what, what came out of this? Yeah. I think so. I think so. I think so. Very interesting. I really have a sense of that there is a genuine challenge here for you in the next season, how to deal with complexity and still make um, accessible stories or conversation out of it. So I, I do think that that's where the formats are uh, playing a lot of a role. And it depends on how much people are willing to give you kind of loose shackles to mm -hmm. fuck around and find out Yeah, in this. I think we will just try it out. I think that this is the this is the thematic challenge. I have a very uh, practical challenge to see how I fit in uh, producing cities reimagined. Uh, now being back on the job and having uh, other projects on the side as well. So this is since this is just an add on, a free time project. It will be quite challenging, but I I enjoy it so much and I get so much out of it, so much joy out of it, and so much pleasure. And I think it really touches up on very interesting points which are worth diving in for uh, many, at least the feedback I got is uh, really positive that people find it useful. Yes. But uh, one question a bit more specific to this might be perhaps something that I, I'm learning more from the kind of the artsy stuff is um, uh, how would I put it? How do you um, sh do this in a way where you perhaps counter what a lot of communication professionals say, that you should think about your audience, the target audience, and so on. Think about making it accessible. But how do you think it would be possible to do without thinking about them at all? And just do it because you need find joy in doing it and need to have these conversation and these different aspects of urbanity move along 
and I think that is exactly the pleasure in it because I'm I'm very free to explore whatever topic in whatever form I want to, right? So I'm not I'm not bound to think about target audiences, how to get the message out, how to do that. It's either either I get the joy out of it and it's uh, I find it somehow meaningful and I hope that it is also meaningful for others. So it is a more like a, it's not seeking the 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 people who receive but more like um, seeing if there's like-minded people or people who also find that helpful and seeing how to go along. And that is, has a bit of a different logic out there. Mm -hmm. Because I, I personally, I, I kind of take joy, you know, just uh, I kind of take joy to, to be on a, on a personal budget producing uh, these shows and then comparing myself to, uh, to initiatives and organizations uh, which are loaded with money and you see on social media, you get more likes or more interactions uh, to, to the stuff you produce without a budget than them. That is a bit of a, I have to say that is a bit of a personal, um, personal joy as well. But that brings us, that brings me a bit, bit to what I also learned over the last year that it is so important to be uh, kind of authentic in what you do um, in, in what you personally do, but also it's, might create more inspire uh, might create more inspiration if people are very authentic very open if they share some some vulnerabilities some uncertainties do not do, do not um try to to shine out uh um whoever else is out there but you know having very honest conversations which are joyful at the end of the day yeah you're speaking like a true musician 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 yeah that maybe that comes because i'm i'm at the moment uh, uh again reading uh, rick rubin all right i think that leaves us with a lot of secrets and cliffhangers for season two right so we didn't solve godzilla we we, we got to know godzilla a bit better and now it's about us to to pull him a bit closer and make him a, a closer friend isn't it yeah and, and I would be surprised if anyone is any wiser after this season finale show. Oh, don't you think so? I uh, think that I, I hope so. Yeah, maybe. And if, even if not, I had a great time talking to you, Jonas. Oh yeah, and you made this a, was great. You made a great uh, remix of uh, the City Reimagined Jingles which we will play right now. So Jonas, thank you so much for being on the show again. And yeah, have a good weekend. Thank you. Looking forward to the next. Yeah, what's thanks. coming. Thanks a lot, Johannes. Yeah, you made it to the end of this wild episode of the season finale of Cities Reimagined. Cities Reimagined will take a break from here and will hopefully come back around, let's say, September, October of this year. Let's see how it goes. If we don't come back, then this is the only season of Cities Reimagined, which is also fine because, you know, there's other projects just starting for me now and I'm not sure if I have the time to run this podcast still after that. And... Yeah, having said that, I actually would love to continue it because it is very, very rewarding. So if you like the content, please share it with your friends and colleagues. Give it a like on social media and on your favorite podcasting platform. And with that, we play you out today with the remix of the City's Reimagined Jingle by Jonas Bülent. It's the Godzilla's Fury remix. So give it a listen. It's also a wild one, just like this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to catch you soon.